Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me for a round two, one of my favorite humans, definitely one of my favorite activists. His name is Justin Michael Williams. He is an author, a speaker, a musician. He is interested in all of us learning together how to end racism, not just mitigate, not just ameliorate, but end racism. The reason why I'm having him back is because he has actually started a program based on a realization which led to an understanding that he is currently having. It is so compelling that I feel called to have him back on the podcast to share with us what is arising. So Justin, welcome back and I love you. Elena, I love you so much. Thank you. It's really such an honor to be here to have this discussion with you. It's amazing. It's revolutionary, really, that this discussion is even happening right now. And so that's exactly yeah. right. I first want to send folks to the right place in order to read this manifesto, because you might want to read this prior to listening to our talk. Please give us the link. Yeah. So the best place to go is to the website endingracismtogether.com endingracismtogether.com. And right at the top, you'll click the manifesto and read it. And it looks long when you first look at it. And it's long if you're thinking of it compared to like social media memes, but it's really about a 16 minute read for most people. And so I really hope that it drops into your heart in just the most beautiful way and helps, you know, blossom open into what we're going to talk about today. It definitely did for me. Mm. Definitely did for me. So the first quote with which you begin, John Lewis, may he rest in peace. Yeah. He's the late civil rights leader, former U.S. representative, real change maker. Like, yeah. please, can we all be like John Lewis when we grow up? Right. Most of the quotes we hear about the fight against racism, just those three words really speak volumes about what the perception that we're shifting. Yeah. Most of the quotes we hear about the fight against racism sound something like this, quote, we used to say that ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, maybe even many lifetimes, and each one of us in every generation must do our part. Again, this is John Lewis speaking. You go on to say, after using that quote at the very beginning of your manifesto, if we all continue to say that, quote, racism is something that can never end in our generation, then who the hell ever gets to take responsibility for ending it, you, you ask? Mm -hmm. And the answer is us. Yeah. And the reason why I'm having Justin here is because, as he says, as he continues, we still have a dream. We can be the vessels for the dreams our ancestors were unable to dream. I get chills hearing you. I get chills hearing you, hearing you read it. Yeah. Every time I, I read this, I've read this probably at least half a dozen times. <laughs> like just to make sure that I'm not crazy, that this is actually real. Uh, you know, I get chills because I remember the moment that that line came through. Um, mm. We still have a dream, but we are the vessels for the dreams our ancestors were unable to dream. And you know, when you hear something and you feel something that comes through you that you know is absolute truth and it drops into your being in, in a way that it, you know is unmistakable. Um, I remember that moment. And it was actually one of the last things that got added to the article, to be honest. It was, it was late, late, late in the game. Like I'm talking five days before it came out. And I knew there was something missing. And I said, universe, I know you want this message out. Like spirit, God, universe, uh, everything. I know you want this out. So show me what the missing link is because I feel it and I can't find it with my mind. 
and then that's that's what came. And so, yeah, it's big. It's big. <laughs> it's bigger it's big. than big. Yeah. I'll go on and sort of continue to paraphrase what you're working on because I think it's important and, and I think my listener needs to hear what exactly is at stake here. Cool. We're talking about the current work and research on anti-racism. Yes, it's phenomenal. It's tireless. It has been done for generations. Most of it has this one fatal flaw, as Justin points out. It's created from the automatic assumption, whether subconscious or conscious, that racism is unlikely to ever end. And you go on to say that if that's our starting point, if that's the plateau from which we're writing our books and creating our podcasts, doing all our activism and anti-racism work, we're missing a big opportunity here. Now, we're not saying that becoming an anti-racist or dismantling white supremacy isn't the most important work because it is. Put that right next to climate change. Yeah. The current anti-racist and equality work has real impact because it is saving lives. It is creating systemic change. It is bringing us together. And that matters. Also, Justin points out that he isn't minimizing the centuries of incredible work done by civil rights leaders such as John Lewis, Martin Luther, the King Jr., Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, countless names we'll never know, without whom we would never have the opportunity to even consider ending racism. But what you are saying is this. Imagine how much more important the work becomes if it were done in a different context, if it were done not just as some sort of boot camp and a lifelong fight, but with a common united goal of actually ending racism in this generation. Okay. My listener is still with me. We look then in your manifesto at the image. You have a beautiful graphic of what it looks like to fight racism. Okay. And the racism is a big black circle in the center. And then coming from it with arrows sort of squirreling around from the center, dismantling white supremacy supremacy, ending the school to prison pipeline, food equity, equality in the workplace, becoming an anti-racist, reallocating resources. Okay. Note to my listener, because I know I have Republican listeners. I love you so much. We're not talking about taking all the money and dismantling the police force entirely. <laughs> no, we are never, not at all. <laughs> please know that we are not talking, we are talking about reallocating resources. This is important. So that was yeah. a tangent. We'll get back to that maybe. Important tangent. Yeah, important tangent. Here's what moving toward something looks like. The next graphic is this. If you're not looking at the manifesto, there's a, a circle that says racism right on the left, which is also black. And then on the right side, there's another circle that says ending racism. All of those squirrely lines that were formerly just reaching out like a sun ray out into nowhere, all of those lines now reach from racism to, ant to ending racism. So becoming an anti-racist toward the end of ending racism, reallocating resources toward the end of ending racism, dismantling white supremacy. I could go on ending the school to prison pipeline, food equity, workplace equality. All that goes toward a direction of ending racism. Justin, you go on to ask us to notice what comes up for us when you say end racism. What do you feel when you put a timeline on it? Like this could happen for us. Do you feel hopeful, skeptical, cynical? Are you thinking who the F does this guy think he is? <laughs> Are you wishing that he would define race and racism? Are you hoping for an actual plan? Really think about this for a second, my listener, because before we can begin to look at how to end it, both the systemic racism of which we've all been a part and the very insidious, totally unconscious, internalized racism, Justin goes on to say that he thinks it's important that we understand what makes racism persist. Justin, once we've been stuck in a condition working on the same damn thing over and over to no end, it becomes important, you say, to shift the question from what's the problem to why does it persist in the first place? Okay. I love that you go on to share these five very much mutually agreed upon, yet very individual assumptions. Would you like to say those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I give these five assumptions that we make about racism and why it might persist. And number one is 
that racism is unavoidable. Number two is that race matters. Number three, and this is a big one, is that we think, well, racism can't end because those people will never change, pointing the finger out there. Number four is that, well, racism can't end because real change takes too long, takes a long time, can't happen in our generation. And number five is that we don't know how to end it, that racism hasn't ended because if we knew how to end it, we would have already ended it. And so I I go to break down these assumptions for us and how this might be causing racism to persist. Thank you. You know, I did a talk yesterday on my Instagram with a fellow colleague of mine from my work who is white girl raised in Utah, who is a Republican and absolutely voting for Trump. And she and I came to a really beautiful understanding that one of the things we can do for each other is actually just listen to each other and hear each other and respect each other and build a sense of trust with each other by yeah. this listening. She is really truly under the impression that the violence with a capital V is being caused by the movement of Black Lives Matter. And I understand her perspective. I want my listener to stick with me right now for a second because this is going somewhere. If you happen to see it, it doesn't matter if you see it or you don't see it. How do I, how could I possibly, as a nice white Jewish girl from Long Island who was raised loving the black community, who has done so much work in the last several months on dismantling all of my internalized unconscious white supremacy and learning the actual history that I wasn't taught, How could I possibly honor the thought that BLM is causing all this violence? And it's not that I agree with her, and I need you to understand this, my listener. I don't agree. I don't agree with her assumption that black people, I say it's capital B, are causing this problem. What's causing this problem is a combination of individuals plus propaganda plus a narrative that is being fed to my dear friend. Yeah. She's not looking at other sources of news. She's looking in one place. And my God, it's causing this assumption, number three, that those people will never change. This has got to be, my listener, at the top of your mind, that everybody can change. I have changed. I am a different person. I understand different things. I see race, color differently now than I did as a child. And I had a mom who was raised by a black woman. Like that black woman was basically my second grandmother. (laughs) In many ways, more together than my own, but I loved her. Um, (laughs) But what I can say is this, these shared individual assumptions, we've got to first see them. I have to see my colleague, my white colleague who was raised, she she was still using the word colored. I had to explain to her that, oh, that wasn't okay. I, can't, I know it's funny, but it's what? not like, uh, yeah, I cried. Like, 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 wow, really? In 2014, 20, 2020, wow. Honestly, she actually didn't know. And wow. I wrote her, we, we came to it during the, the live. I explained to her about my black grandmother and how she sat me down one day and said, don't listen to your grandmother who still uses the word colored. Use people of color, please. This was in the late 70s. Yeah. Guys, 40 something years. I'm turning 50 this year. I feel so much pride for my friend's willingness to learn what I taught her and to then reach out in every comment on the thread below that video. She personally apologized to each person. Mm. who took offense she owned every bit of it she herself has adopted a black child from the dominican and that was the the there are so many things that need to be healed and the only way that we can heal these things is to explore these shared individual assumptions and as you say in your piece own and acknowledge that we as both individuals and as a collective we see things through a certain lens we've got to stop agreeing on that lens and we've got to stop looking through that lens and seeing a different way. 
We haven't actually evolved. Okay. And so the point here is that our world in general is created upon these shared beliefs, even if they're not necessarily true. And in order to end racism, we have to own and acknowledge that we are seeing things through that faulty lens, sometimes faulty lens. And if enough people choose to see the same through the same faulty lens, that chosen perspective, which has now happened, becomes the context through which we live our lives. And in essence, as you say, if enough people share that same socially perceived illusion, those illusions can cause a certain way of life to persist. This is what we're dismantling. Yeah. Yeah. Number one, racism is unavoidable. I would love for you to talk about this. There are a couple of studies that you cited, uh, neuroscientists and psychologists uh, that have discovered that racism is, in fact, learned. Yeah, yeah. So can I speak to one thing that you said, Elena? Sure, Um, sure. sure. So that just feels really important to me is a, a big piece of this article and when it came through was I actually was feeling the intensity in my body and in my mind and in my nervous system around the the propaganda that I was even feeling coming at me from the media and the news and the different places that I was looking, even though I was trying to diversify. And right. what I did was I disconnected from it for two weeks, right in the middle of all the action, you know, and I gave myself like forgiveness and permission to go, you can disconnect from this. Not disconnecting from the movement. I was still reading. I was reading books. I was learning. But disconnect from the media and what it was telling me. And what I asked was a question was this. I said, if I disconnect from the media and I stay connected energetically to the world, what arises naturally for me? What comes through that wants to be said? And this is the article that came through. And what was super clear for me and why I was very particular is this article is not political. No one can read it and say that it's political. This is quite literally just about lives, all of our lives, not black lives, not white lives, not people. It's about all of our lives together here on this planet and breaking down this illusion that we have that we are separate, that we have to be against one another. And, and bringing us back to the center, which is what I truly believe is people, Republican, Democrats, and everything in between. What I find from all the people that I talk to, and I have so many white friends and so many white clients and so many is, and even Republican ones, is that most people are good. <laughs> most people really are good and want to be good. Exactly. And a lot of people just don't know. You know, mm-hmm. they really don't know. And I, that's why I love the story that you shared, because when we know better, like Maya Angelou says, we can do better. And, but if we're shaming and blaming people into knowing, then they're not going to listen. And so this is, for me, this was a, a real, a beautiful birthing of how this, of how this article came through in that way. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to comment on that before I got into the, into the points. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, cool. I, I feel like we should just go through the five points. I would yep. love for you to talk about it in your words so that we can hear from you. And Great. then we'll move forward. So, okay. So the five points, and basically to recontextualize this for you, it's it's around, these are the five points that if these things are true, maybe it's why racism exists or not. And so the first one that I go into is that racism is unavoidable. And that's something that we all think, even though it's been proven, like scientifically, neuroscience, psychologists all over the world, is that Racism is learned. It's not automatic. We're not born with it. It's not something that just happens by putting a bunch of diverse people together on the planet. It's it, what the truth is, is that racism is what created race. It's not that just because we have mm. different races, that racism must exist. And, you know, the thing that I have to make sure I name here that was really important, I was talking to Dan Siegel, who's become a really good friend of mine. And I had ran the article by him and he said, let's put some science, some more science in here. Because what is true is that we as primates do create in groups and out groups. And so I don't, I want to make sure people know that I understand this part of it. And studies show that we treat people who are in our in groups better and people who are in our out groups more harshly. But the truth is, is that using race as a way of defining who's in the in group and who is an out group is something that we can change if we choose to. Just like 
we don't necessarily say people are in our in-group or out-group based upon the color of their hair. Like imagine if instead of skin color for race, we used hair color, you know, and it wasn't about if your skin was white or your skin was black, it's what your hair color was. And like, so we can see how this shifts based upon our illusions. And so, you know, what I, what I say here is that when we say something is unavoidable, unavoidable, like racism is unavoidable, it pulls us into resignation and resignation for me is the complete opposite of possibility. And if we're saying racism is unavoidable, you can see that, yes, it's going to be something that's challenging for us to solve. But the idea that racism is unavoidable is like saying, well, the Holocaust was unavoidable or slavery was unavoidable Mm. or refusing the LGBTQIA plus the community, the right to marry was unavoidable. And this is dangerous because then we throw our hands up, you know, and we say, oh, I can't do anything about that. We resign. Can't do anything about it. And I write in the article oh, I can't do anything about slavery, can't do anything about gay marriage, can't do anything about the spread of HIV, can't do anything about women's rights, can't do anything about racism until somebody finally does. And I think our generation can do it. We can, and we can because of the generations of work that have come before us. Right, right. Yeah. There's actually one last I don't know, question that I have on this one before we move on to race matters. Yeah. Like, why is it that nobody said this before? Elena, I have no freaking idea. You have to get, okay. So I had the idea for the article, came through, and I'll give you the actual moment. Like I was reading, I was disconnected and I was reading all the books. I I was doing my education as a person on the planet, not because even though the book said, oh, these are books for white people, I was like, well, I'm going to read so that I know how to educate my community and my friends, you know? Yeah. And yeah. and so I was doing my work and I kept finding, God, why does every single book say that it can't end? It's going to be a lifelong fight. It's going to keep going forever. And And so I said, there must be somewhere, somebody who's saying that it can end somewhere, right? And I was just researching and researching and I couldn't find anything. I was just so like, bizarre to me. I was just like, bizarre to me. what? <laughs> yeah. And so I just kept being in that question. People mm-hmm. say racism can't end. Racism can't end. It'll be a lifelong fine. It can't end in this generation. And I kept asking, well, why the hell not? Why not? Because it definitely won't end if we don't say it can. So, yeah. Which actually moves us perfectly into point number two. Yeah. The assumption that race matters. Yeah. You quote Toni Morrison, who said, there's no such thing as race, none. There's just a human race, scientifically, anthropologically. Now, you do qualify this and say that you don't, you don't want us to misunderstand and think for one second that you're saying the effects of racism aren't real. Trauma, deaths, lives lost, the impact, the persistent collective belief. This has really real consequences. Created wars, dismantled countries, pitted religions against one another, taken innocent black and brown lives for generations. It's happening yesterday, like right now. Yeah. But the opportunity is far greater than this. And this can be triggering or hard to stomach for certain of us. And I just want you to stick with us for a second. The concept of race is literally imaginary. This is coming from a black man. Imaginary. Someone created it at some point back in the day in order to subjugate an entire race and make money. I got got angry for a second. I'm going to stop yelling. Please. Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. I can't even... And this is a way that somebody at the very beginning of the history of our world was able to maintain power and control. And now we use it unconsciously, get this, to control ourselves. Yeah, to control ourselves. Justin, read the next series of lines. Race is not real real. from there. This is real. It's race is not real. Heritage is real. Culture Mm -hmm. is real. Tradition is real. Appropriation is real. Skin color is real. Trauma is real. But race, not real. Mm -hmm. Or it's as real as we make it. You know, it's as real as we make it. 
And this is precisely where we've gone terribly wrong. Totally. And we've assumed that some, what someone said some freaking hundreds of years ago about the capacity of a certain skin color, that became race and that has become our assumption. And yes, it does matter, but not in the way that we thought. No. Yeah. The assumption that race matters is actually what we're trying to dismantle right now because the truth is skin color, heritage, tradition, appropriation, all these things that Justin just named, those are real. But we are making race into an interpretation when it is not a fact. Yeah. And I think, Elena, like, this is the big thing that felt this for me, to be honest with you, was the one, the part of the article that I was the most, I don't want to say scared to write, but I was like, whoo, I'm going to have a I few, che so. I had, you know, I had a few check-ins on this one with some other activists and leaders to make sure that I wasn't, you know, really missing a blind spot. And they were all with me. They said, this is mm -hmm. big, but the truth is, I don't think, and I say this in the article, we don't actually care that much about race as an individual concept. Like how much, when you really allow yourself to think about it, if you were allowed to keep all of your traditions and customs and values and assembling with like-minded people and were able to be treated with equality and dignity and truth, like if we could, if you could keep all that, how important is the concept of race? as an individual concept and what is its function for us? What does it actually do to say, we're gonna separate these people by race? What does that actually do for us? And you know, this is where I really insert that line in the article saying racism created race, not the other way around. And the, if you even look at the history of the word race and where that became popularized. Like we're not, the word race doesn't go all the way back to the beginning of human history. It didn't even exist in most languages. And so this is a really important thing for us to recognize is we're seeing something. I don't say this in the article, but it feels really nice to unpack this with you here. We're seeing a moment in history that feels like forever to us with our limited human capacity of time as individuals. But when we're looking right. at the big picture of the world, like what we have created around race and slavery and racism and differentiating people based on the color of their skin is this, that is our time. That is this modern era's thing that we have attached to and created our entire world based upon it, hmm. you know? And so the, the thing that I'll just say about this to close that out is just, like you said, someone created this concept of race to enforce power and control and quite frankly, to make money. And it worked, you know, it worked. And, mm -hmm. and we continue now to reinforce that upon ourselves. And I don't think that our, I don't wanna again say that our heritage doesn't matter and our values and our cultures and all the things that we care about and our skin color and all those things matter. But race itself, mm -mm. put in the garbage can. <laughs> like that's what I think. There is, there is a lot to undo. Yeah. The thing that is sitting at the right in front of my prefrontal cortex is the school to prison pipeline that has to change. Yeah. Yeah. Number three, those people will never change. The third assumption that yeah. we commonly hold. <laughs> um, I am just personally, as some sort of ad hoc representative of the white humans in your life. I just can't stop saying I'm sorry for that. This isn't, um, this isn't a really sad story that Justin presents in this particular number three, because he talks about his buddy, Greg, who's a white guy, grew up in Tennessee with basically surrounded by racist friends and family members who believed firmly that capital B black people were stupid and lazy. Yeah. And he really held a whole series of beliefs that were derivatives of that one. And he basically said to you, quote, if I hadn't dramatically fucked up my life, 
if I would have still been working in finance with a house on a lake and a bunch of toys like many of the people he grew up with, he would probably, he was saying, I would probably still be a white supremacist with a Confederate flag hanging from my truck. Yeah. End quote. But that's not the Greg you know. No. This Greg that you know went through a massive change 15 years ago. And, and I'm speaking about this, my listener, because this is evidence that things can and will change. 15 years ago, he met you because you were giving a talk at his company about ending racism. And he came up at the end and he asked for resources to help his five-year-old son grow up on the right side of history. This is where I get tears in my eyes. Every time, because he saw that what he learned to our earlier point was completely false an assumption, some belief that somebody put into his head, a parent, a, a, a sibling, and he committed to making sure his young white son didn't grow up a racist. Yeah. Yeah. This is happening all over this country. Yeah. And yeah. we have to put our attention there. It's happening with regards to homophobia. It's happening with regards to all the sort of random, jokey, tone-deaf, racist comments that are made that need to end now. People are changing it. Yeah. It's big. It's big. And, you know, the the thing that was important why I told the story about Greg in particular, and I had so many stories to tell, is because Greg is not a rare person. Like, we all have the Greg in our lives, right? We mm. have our mm. once racist family members who've changed. We have our formerly tone deaf coworkers who've changed, the people in our lives who used to be homophobic, who, who've grown greater in their understanding. Do they have further to go? Sure, maybe. But we even can look at the ways in our own lives in which we have changed personally around race and beyond. And I know I even personally have changed a lot around race, Elena. Like, I'm biracial. My mom is Persian and Italian and my dad is black. And I grew up, you know, my parents were divorced and I grew up in a home where I was the only black man in my house. And my mm -hmm. cousins have blonde hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, like my grandparents, like my great grandma who was alive when I was a kid got here on a boat from Sicily. So we have like Italian- Justin, I didn't know this. Yeah. Yeah. This is my heritage. Oh my and- and you know what is has been really important for me to name here, and this was the second story that was almost going to go into the article, is when my mom got engaged to my dad, my family, my Italian family, disowned my mom because my dad was black. And they kicked her out of the house. And she went to go live with my dad's mom. And then a little while later, and my mom got married, had her wedding, everything. Nobody from my mom's side of the family even came. And then a little while later, the family came back. And that same grandpa who disowned my mom originally was one of the most loving, most mm. secure male figures in my life growing up. He loved me oh. inside out and healed his racism directly within. He literally had not one inch of that left in his bones when he passed away. And so I, when I'm talking about people can change, I'm not just being hypothetical. We've experienced it in our life. I've experienced it in my family in front of my eyes, you know, and from both sides. Because imagine how my dad and his family feel when they're taking in my mom from their racist family that's kicking her out because of my dad, their son. Oh. And then for that family, that same family on both sides to come back together. And my grandpa would was mowing, like when I was, before he died, he was mowing and doing the yard work at my black grandmother's house, you know, as oh a favor. God. And so this is what can happen when we listen, when we learn, when we come together, when we come to that common place that we all know that we really just want to be happy and well and good and that everyone deserves that. And I know that's what we all believe here listening. So anyway, I just wanted to tell that story because that's that's my real story around my family and race. 
That's the most important thing. I'm ugly crying right now. <laughs> I can hear it. <laughs> I um. Oh God! I just first of all, you're the perfect person for this initiative. Mm. I'm so glad to be talking about this with you. You've 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 had it, and it leads directly into the assumption slash belief number four which is the mistaken notion that real change takes a long time. It simply doesn't. No. Let's look at some of the most massive changes in recent human history, shall we? Yeah. From, from Justin's manifesto, start and end dates below represent unmistakable widespread shifts. Okay, if you want to put the manifesto in front of you, do it. 1973, the first phone call was made on a handheld cellular phone. In 1995, widespread global use of mobile phones. That's 22 years. Second example, 1991, creation of the World Wide Web. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> 2001, total widespread use of the internet, one decade. 1981, first documented case of HIV in the US. And by 1995, 14 years later, the ability to detect, treat, and live with HIV is a complete reality for many people that yeah. we know. 2004, the first US state legalizes same-sex marriage. 2015, national legalization, 11 years. Yeah. 11 years, how about this? 1933, Hitler's first position of leadership and the formation of the Nazi party. In 12 years, the end of the Holocaust happened. And reparations began to be made now. Yeah. That's one that I really like to anchor with people to really think yes. about because this is one that we can all really feel and, and, and see because we've learned about it at length in school. And literally when I researched this, I was shocked. I have, I have goosebumps on my arms again from when, the, when I first read it. Hitler's literally his first ever position of trying to be a leader of anything in a little, it was a tiny little, little organization that wasn't even called the Nazi party yet, where mm -hmm. he was becoming like a chair. And then the Nazi party forming after that, all the way till the last concentration camp closing and the end of the Holocaust was a 12 year period, 12 years. And so when people say to me, real change takes a long time, and I have to be honest, I actually, Elena, when I was writing this, this was the this was the one I was the most scared to write, not because to put it out, but I thought yeah. if this isn't true, then my whole article is false. Then we can't end it in one generation. But it's not. So many of the massive changes in human history like fall into this period of being less than 25 years. In fact, most of them are 10 to 20 years. And so, yeah. of course, does every change fall in this category? No. Were there years of undocumented labor and work and blood, sweat, and tears that came before the dates that I'm starting? Of course. like, And that's what I want to make sure people know. And I say in the article is my intention with putting these start and end dates is not to you know, minimize the work that's come by the people who've right. come before right. us, but it's to show that, hey, y'all, look, once the ground has been prepared, major, massive shifts can happen. And that ground has been prepared for us now. This epic understanding that, I mean, I've compared the advent of slavery and the way that black people have notoriously been treated in particularly in our country, but really all over the world. I've compared that to the Holocaust. I've compared the way we came in and decimated the Native American community murdered, looted, raped. I've compared that to the Holocaust in my own mind and also actually out loud. And to know that that disgusting, murderous man could have been put down in 12 years and we are still living with all of the ramifications of what we're talking about here today, which is how we treat people of color. This is where I get really hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Which leads to the final point, which is the assumption that we don't know how to end it, but we do. We do. There are plenty of not just good, but excellent solutions, as you say, for ending racism. 
Things created by researchers, anti-racist scholars, universities, entire college campuses dedicated to the cause. People have created model system structures, best-selling books for generations, any of which could easily solve this problem and not just hypothetically. We have seen the problem solved in micro but significant ways all throughout time. And I thought it might be interesting to talk about that. What were your findings? What yeah. as a society, individuals, collective, wh what did you find? Well, it was interesting because I was going through like uh, the micro, micro examples and then some of the macros. And so you look at even the story that I just told about racism in my own family. If we just put the family unit into a bubble and talk about does racism exist in my family now, in that same family unit? Okay, well, maybe in some subconscious ways, but absolutely not in the way that it did when my mom got engaged to my dad. And then I started looking at companies and organizations and different systems and structures that when we isolate them, we see that we have made changes individually with right. people we know and in our organizations and groups and our friend right. groups even. And so the idea that racism, that we don't know what to do or that we can't end it, that's, that's to me not the actual problem. Mm. The problem is, can I say it? <laughs> can I yes. go to that point? Okay. The, I say it. Do the, it. The problem is that we need to be ready for the solutions to actually work. We need to be ready and willing to show up for the solutions to work. And this is one of the things, Elena, that I say over and over, and unfortunately it's not in the article because I didn't want it to be too long, but I think one of the biggest problems that we have that is causing us to not step into the solution is we're so busy arguing over what the world might look like when racism is over and exactly how we're going to get there. So for example, just to give this like super clear for everybody, I use this metaphor sometimes of like, imagine a caterpillar saying, you know what, nature, universe, mm -mm, I'm not going to get into this cocoon until you tell me exactly what color my wings are going to be and exactly what pattern are going to be on my wings. Until you mm. tell me exactly what it's going to look like on the other side of this, I'm not getting into the cocoon. Mm. And I feel like that's a part of what we're doing. We're saying, mm, until we know exactly what policy, exactly what the world's going to look like, exactly how it's going to happen, then we can't end racism. Instead, we should just focus on these smaller issues that are a little bit more easy for us to tackle and digest. Right, right. And that's an issue, you know? Yep, that makes sense. Each of us in our own way has some dismantling to do. Of course. If we're, if we're white or black. Yes, yes. Especially if we're white. No, especially all of us, to be honest with you. I, I completely disagree fully and openly with the fact that white people are going to be the only ones to solve this problem. If we were going to live in a world where white people and black people were going to be totally separate, if our aim isn't integration and coming together, then sure, white people can do it on their own. But black people, I know even for me myself, we have to learn how to process, not just express our anger and our rage so that we can come together on the other side of the divide and be there for conversations when people are getting messy and making mistakes. We have to look at how we're living the white supremacist values within ourselves in the ways that we're showing up for the way we dress and what we're doing with our hair and what we think we value and how we've colonized our time. Like there's so much work. It's different work sometimes. Sometimes it's different work, but we all have to step up to the plate together mm -hmm. to do this mm -hmm. if this thing's going to end, all of us. My dear friend Misha, with whom I was conversing yesterday, she's a black woman raising several kids, beautiful, capable. I love her so much. She's become a very good friend over the last eight years. And um, she had an interesting point yesterday, which I want to address. Calling black, brown, indigenous people, people of color, weirdly still centers personhood on white people and whiteness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And despite people of color being a global majority, you're still actually quantified as subgroups for statistical purposes and your secondary in political and social arenas. That was a real wake up call for me. And I want my listener to hear that. Like even that 
will have to change if we are to end racism. Yep. Yep. And and that is, Elena, if I can just say on that, like when people go into this concept of white supremacy, this is why it's something that we literally are swimming in and sometimes can't see it. Because yep. in the context of white supremacy, it's even hard to talk about a person of color without centering whiteness first. Because right. basically what it's saying is, the basic way that I like to define white supremacy is saying that whiteness is supreme and that you have to have something to assess your life up to, to see whether or not you're living up to a standard. And so when we look at whiteness, when we even say, oh, those people are too loud, too loud compared to what? To whiteness. Right. They're not dressed appropriately. Appropriately compared to what? What are we standardizing against? Whiteness. Whiteness. Their hair Whiteness. is not appropriate. Their music's not appropriate. The, this. So you look at every sector of the world and you find that you can't even say, like even saying person of color is comparing it to the standard of whiteness. And so it's, it's like, sickening. This so is the crazy. sickening part. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> right when you think, okay, I'm, I'm getting on the right side of things as a white person, honestly, <laughs> to realize that this is actually still perpetuating it is precisely why we need to keep talking. Yeah. And that's, and I will say, Elena, that with like the most loving open arms, is why I don't get into any of that in the article. Because right. my purpose of the article is for us to feel what it would be like to stand in the possibility of re mm. ending racism and then looking back from that point and then saying, what did we do then? If racism has ended, then what did we do in 2020? You know, and that is the place that I wanted to write from, because when we get into all the definitions and the this and the that, one of my mentors, Jim Selman, says this great thing. It's like there's a lot of conversations about change. We like to pontificate about change and pontificate about racism and race and talk about it in circles and drive it. But there are not that many conversations that are actually changing something. Mm. And my goal was not to have a conversation about race but a conversation that helped racism to end. And that yeah. is, that, those are two very different things, you know? And so that's why I didn't get into all those, all that. That was smart because it's not, it's it's down the road a ways. Yeah, totally. It's down the, it, but it is absolutely, I'm so glad that we arrived on it here. Misha, when you listen to this, I love you. Thank you for pointing that out. I have to, to me. meet Misha. That's amazing. Cool. You sure do. She's on the team also. She's an incredible powerhouse. She was on our office hours this month ah, for September. Okay. Yeah, you, if you go watch the office hours, you'll fall in love instantly. You've been warned. Um, <laughs> okay. I think that we are at a good ending point. The goal now is to get as many folks as possible to consider that racism can and should end in this generation. And what I'd love for you to do is delineate the five ways that we can help right now. Yeah. Okay. This is really important. So the first thing that we did was we created a pledge to end racism, created this beautiful pledge with Michelle Martello, who you know so well. And um, mm. the pledge, we have a goal of getting 25% of the population to sign it. And the truth is if we get 1.9 billion people to sign the pledge, then that means we have enough power to end racism, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And so some people go, oh my God, that's a big number, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah, racism is a big thing that we have to end. And yes, is, is, you know, it is. And the truth is, is some people are like, well, how are you going to reach that far and all of this? And here's the truth. A coach doesn't go into a game wondering whether if or not they're going to win. We have to play a bigger game now. That's what our generation has the opportunity to do. And what everything we all know is that even if we don't quote unquote get there, we definitely would get way beyond what a reasonable expectation or a predictable result would be. But if we don't commit to ending it, if we don't go for that number, it's never going to end. So let's go for it. So sign the pledge. That's number one after you read the article. And okay. then number two is to donate. This was super special and powerful for me. So we launched an Ending Racism Grant and Scholarship Fund. 
that's 501c3, all tax deductible, that helps us support individuals and organizations, grassroots organizations who the money would make a big deal for, who've taken the pledge and want to do whatever work they're already doing, but do it with the intention of bringing us together and ending racism. And so if anybody wants to donate, you can go to wecandreambigger.org. Wecandreambigger.org is where you get that. And the pledge is at the link that I told you in the beginning, endingracismtogether.com. The third way, which is really simple, and I say this for people who don't have the funds to donate right now, I know COVID is a tough time, is I actually put out one of my songs. So I'm, I'm also a musician. And we took one of my songs called The Turning. And so if you search for The Turning by Justin Michael Williams on any streaming platform, just literally push play, put it on repeat, turn your volume off and let it play overnight over and over and over because we are literally putting all the proceeds that come from streaming that song straight into the mission to end racism forever. So Mm. stream that song as much as you can if you can't donate because those little scents that come from every stream make a big difference. And then finally, you know, show your support, display the graphic on your social media and share this. Sharing it is important because we're not going to get to 25% of the population with just me talking on podcasts. This is about Mm. all of us being a ripple in the pond. You know, one of my favorite quotes by my sister, Shelly Tegelski, who I mentioned at the end of the article is, with enough pebbles thrown into a pond, a ripple becomes a wave. And so each of us have a chance now to spread this article, spread the message, spread this podcast into the corners of the world that only we can reach and in the way that only we can reach it. And so share this. If you do anything, do that because we have to get more people believing and asking that question when they hear racism can't end. We have to get more people asking, well, why the hell not? That's going to change something. I want to say thank you so much for your bravery, your brain, your heart, your mother, Barbara. (laughs) I love love you. I love you, Elena. Yeah, no, I really love you too. And I respect, I respect you so deeply and I can't wait to see how this develops and evolves. Thank you to my listener for staying with us for the entire talk. I think this was one of the most important ones. And thank you also to my listener for being willing to accept the possibility and consider the feasibility that we could, in fact, end racism in our lifetimes. Thank you so much. Love you. Love you too.